Well, good evening. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We continue our series, Signposts. We're looking at some pointers in the Old Testament, some pictures, incidents that happened, that with the benefit of hindsight, we can see point forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus and the salvation that he brought. Tonight, we're going to go back in time to about 1500 BC, to the first Passover. The nation of Israel were slaves down in Egypt, but God had a plan that he was going to liberate them. He was going to set them free. And this is what is known as the Passover. Uh, you may remember that there were a series of plagues that God brought to try to persuade Pharaoh to let the people go. And so we've had nine plagues. Maybe you remember from Sunday school days, we were all asked to, to, to list some of the plagues, some of the dreadful plagues that fell upon Egypt. But we've come now to the final plague. And that was that at midnight, the firstborn in every household was going to die. And that wasn't only the firstborn human being, it was the firstborn of livestock, cattle, sheep, goats, whatever they had in the house, in the household, the firstborn would die. It would be a catastrophic judgment that would affect everyone. The Bible says, right from the palace where Pharaoh dwelt, right to the, the beggar in the street almost, every household, every family would be affected by this dreadful judgment. And so it's the last judgment as God tries to persuade Pharaoh to let his people go. But it also gives us one of the clearest, one of the most dramatic pictures of salvation that we'll ever find in the Bible. It's a wonderful picture. And so if the Israelites in Egypt were going to be sheltered by the blood of the Passover lamb, and it's a wonderful picture how the believers can be sheltered by the blood of Christ. Let's read the details. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and strike it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Amen. Now, there is no doubt that this is a picture of the Lord Jesus and his death on the cross and the salvation that we have in him. In fact, in the New Testament, Paul, he makes a direct link between this Passover lamb and Jesus, the Lamb of God. And he says, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And just as the Israelites were sheltered by the blood of the Passover lamb, so Paul is saying, we have the reality. That was just a picture. The reality is that Christ is our Passover, and he was the Passover lamb who was sacrificed for us. Tonight, I want to focus on three things about the blood of the Passover lamb, and by extension, the blood of Christ. First of all, we're going to think about shedding the blood. Then secondly, we're going to think about striking the blood, because they were told to strike the blood upon the doorposts of the houses. And then thirdly, we're going to think about seeing the blood. And so first of all, God told them that the blood must be shed. They had to shed the blood of the land. 
Now, first of all, they had to select it. We read that together. They had to choose from their flock. And it had to be not just any lamb. It had to be simply the best they had. They had to check to make sure it had no blemish. It had nothing wrong with it. It had to be the best possible lamb. And not only uh, was it to be the best possible lamb, but they had to keep it for three days and they had to scrutinize it. They had to just keep checking it just in case something came to light. And you see, right at the beginning, we're being told that this sacrifice, this lamb, it has to be perfect. It has to be without any blemish, without any defect in it. And of course, it's a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus. Peter, when he talks about the Lord Jesus, he speaks of him as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He's really quoting from this very passage, and he's telling us, and Peter knew the Lord Jesus, perhaps like no one else, and Peter is telling us that he is a spotless lamb, that the Lord Jesus Christ is a spotless person. He is absolutely holy. He's absolutely pure. There's no defect in him. Now, dear friends, that is so important, because I need a spotless savior. I cannot depend on another sinful person to save me because that person, he would need a savior himself. I need somebody who is spotless, who is without sin in order to save me from my sins, in order to pay the price for my sins. And the Bible says that the Lord Jesus is holy. He's without sin. He's completely sinless. He's a spotless lamb. And not only that, the Lord Jesus was scrutinized as well. He was, he was watched, not just for three days, but really for three years. Uh, he was scrutinized, you could almost say, for 33 years he was scrutinized. He was looked at. He was checked. His friends watched him. His enemies watched him. Angels watched him. Demons watched him. God himself watched him. And they all came to this unanimous conclusion that he was absolutely spotless and sinless. And so, dear friends, this Passover lamb, the best, the, the most uh, the cleanest, the most spotless that they could possibly find, it tells us of a spotless Savior, a perfect Savior, a holy Savior. But, dear friends, a holy, spotless, living lamb could never take away my sins. The blood must be shed. You know, there are some people today and they think, well, the life of Christ was wonderful. Dear friends, the life of Christ can only condemn us. The life of Christ can only judge us. People think, well, I'll try to live like he lived. I'll try to copy him. Surely that's the best example. I'll try and follow his example. Dear friends, we will never, ever be saved by trying to follow the life of Christ because the life of Christ only shows up our sinfulness. No, no, dear friends, we need the shedding of blood. That's what the Bible says. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There's no remission of sin. It's impossible for our sins to be forgiven without the price being paid. And so they were told not only to select and to check this lamb and make sure it was the best, but there came the day when its blood must be shed. You know, the Lord Jesus just before his crucifixion, it says this in the Bible, that the time drew near when the Passover must be killed. Now, that was true about the celebration they had every year, but it was absolutely true about Christ, our Passover. Dear friends, a living Savior could never save me. I need a Savior who's willing to die and shed his blood on the cross. And that's exactly what happened when the Lord Jesus was crucified. It was a sacrifice. He was giving himself for my sins to shelter me, to save me. And so the blood, as it coursed through the veins of that spotless lamb, that could do me no good. The blood must be shed. And dear friends, the great news of the gospel is this, that the Lord Jesus, 2,000 years ago, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. He died on the cross for our sins. And dear friends, you'll never, ever find salvation and forgiveness. You'll never find peace with God. You'll never be right for heaven. You'll never escape the judgment of God unless you realize that his death on the cross was absolutely essential for my salvation. The blood must, first of all, be shed. But there's something else. 
You see, what happened was they killed the lamb and they collected his blood in a, in a bowl or in a basin. But that blood in the bowl, the blood in the veins of the lamb could never save me. And the blood in the bowl could never save me. They had to do something else. And they had to take, the Bible t t talks about hyssop. It was just a small plant. They used it almost like, you would almost say like a paintbrush. And they had to dip that into the bowl and they had to strike the blood of the lamb. They had to strike it on the lintel and down the two side posts of the door. They had to apply the death of the lamb to their house. Now, this is a wonderful picture. You know, it is true that the Lord Jesus died for our sins, that he died to provide salvation, that his death on the cross is the sacrifice that we're reading about when the blood was shed for our salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins. But dear friends, it will do us absolutely no good unless we strike the blood against the doorpost. In other words, unless we apply his death and get the value of his death for ourselves. You see, I don't understand that. Well, I'm quite sure that when they were told, you know, you've got to take the blood, you've got to put it over the top and you've got to put it down the sides, they wouldn't have a clue. They wouldn't understand what that was about. They would have no idea what was really being taught here. But dear friends, what we're being told is simply this, that I need to make the death of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, good for myself. How do I do that? Well, when I come as a sinner and I realize that, yes, he did die on the cross. His blood was shed so that I could be saved. But I want that applied to me. I want, I want to know the benefit of that myself and by simple faith, because that's what they did. If they didn't believe God, they wouldn't do this. But the very fact they did it, they maybe didn't understand it. But the very fact they did it showed that they believed God. It was faith in what God said. And dear friends, when I was just a boy and I trusted the Savior, I didn't understand what it was all about. I didn't understand what the death of Christ meant. But I understood this, that I couldn't work it out, but I believed he died for me. And I simply accepted him to be my Savior. And, and it's a very deliberate word, this, to strike the blood. It, it implies a very definite and deliberate action. And it was a mark of faith and belief and trust in what God has said. Now, let me ask you, dear friends, you may know that the blood has been shed, that Christ has died on the cross. I wonder, has the blood been applied in your life? Have you trusted the Savior for yourself? Have you made him your own? Have you come to realize, yes, he died on the cross for me. I don't understand how it works, but I believe that God has said that Christ died for my sins, and I take him to be my Savior. He's been raised from the dead. He's alive. I believe in him. I trust in him. And when you do that, you are deliberately striking the blood. And you've probably seen artists' impressions and pictures of this, and, and you've seen the lintel, and you've seen the two door posts, and you'll see the blood splashed over it. And the whole household, symbolized by that door, is covered and sheltered by the blood of the Lamb. Dear friends, can I say this? I am absolutely sure tonight that I am sheltered by the blood of Christ. There's no safety like it. There's no security like it because the blood has been shed. Not only that, when I was a young boy, I took the blood, as it were, and I smeared it over the doorposts of my heart and my life, and I believed that he died for me, and I made him my savior. And so we've thought about shedding the blood. We've thought about striking the blood on the doorposts. Ah, uh, but there's another wonderful thing here. God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Think of that, seeing the blood. And God says, I'll pass over you. It doesn't mean that God would pass by, that, that the, somehow that the, the plague would just skip a door. It's not that idea at all. It's the idea that when God saw the blood, the blood would be a sign. And when God saw the blood, God himself would, would pass over. He would shield that door. He would stand between the judgment and the people inside. And he doesn't say, when you see the blood, they couldn't see it. They were inside. Once the blood was applied and they went inside and they closed the door, they couldn't see it anymore. But God said, 
When I see the blood, when I see the blood, it's what I see that matters. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and I will protect you. Well, I can imagine inside one of those houses, I can imagine the eldest son saying, Dad, was it a perfect lamb? Are you sure it was the best? Yes, I'm sure it was the best. Dad, did you, did you really apply it to the, to the doorposts and the lintel? Yes, I did. You saw me do it. And maybe a wee while later, Dad, are you sure that I'm safe? Yes, you're absolutely secure. But Dad, I can't see the blood. It doesn't matter that you can't see it. God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Dear friends, I don't understand, and I confess to you now, I don't have as great an appreciation of what Christ did on the cross as I should have. And I'll tell you this, that throughout eternity, when I'm in heaven, I'll still never fully understand the value of that death, the wonder of what Jesus did when he died on the cross for my sins. I'll never understand it, but I'm glad that my salvation doesn't understand, doesn't depend on my understanding or my appreciation. It depends on God's understanding and God's appreciation. I want you to grasp that tonight that my salvation does not rest on how much I think of the work of Christ. It rests on how much God thinks of it. And God thinks so much of the work of Christ. His own son died on the cross for my sins. And it's the most precious thing to God. And God says, when I see a sinner who's just placed their trust in my son, when I see the blood, I will secure them forever. I will pass over them and they will be eternally safe. Dear friends, 2,000 years ago, the blood was shed. Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. In my case, when I was just a young boy, the blood, I struck it upon the doorposts of my life. I applied it to my heart. I took it to myself. I believed it. I accepted it for me. I wonder, have you done that? Well, if you do that tonight, if you simply come and say, I'm a sinner, I need forgiveness, I understand the only way I can be made right with God is through the death of his son on the cross, and you say, I don't understand what happened, but I simply believe that when he died, he died for me, and I'm trusting him to save me, God says, the blood will be a sign, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. There's nothing like being safe. And there's nothing like being sheltered by the blood of Christ. Dear friend, if you're not sheltered, why not tonight? As it were, take that blood and apply it to your heart and to your life. Believe on the Lord Jesus, trust in him, and God will guarantee that when he sees the blood, he will pass over you. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we give thanks for this wonderful picture of the death of thy son, how poorly we understand it, how poorly we can talk about it, but we pray that somebody tonight may grasp it, perhaps for the first time, that Christ died for their sins and that the blood can be applied, the value of all that he did on the cross can be applied to them and they can shelter under what he did. So we pray for thy blessing as we give thanks in his name. Amen.